A quick note on today's show. We actually recorded prior to the announcement of Colorado formalizing its future membership in the Big 12. The school's board of regents voted unanimously to make the move on Thursday late afternoon. A quote from Colorado President Tom Salomon, which comes from ESPN's article on the issue. Quote, the time has come for us to change conferences. We see this as a way to create more opportunity for the University of Colorado, for our students and our student athletes, and create a path forward for us in the future. End quote. Big 12 Commissioner Brent... Brett Yormark, excuse me, uh, his quote was a little more succinct. He said, quote, they're back, end quote. <laughs> Despite uh, us recording before this news, we talked on the show as though it had already happened because everything was basically formalities. And so just want to make you aware of the reality that we'll talk about things that have not yet happened, even though we knew they were going to. And so the show is essentially the same things we would have said, even if it had already been formalized. Just wanted to give you a heads up before you listen or watch. Enjoy the show. Let's get after it. Finally, I can quit trying to remember that Colorado is in the Pac-12 because, uh, well, they're not going to be anymore. You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, what's up? Welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, the only daily national college hoop show out there. I'm your host today, Isaac Shade, and I want to thank you for joining us to get your first listener watch every single day. Listen, the clear and biggest obvious news of the day is that Colorado will, in all likelihood, unless something goes awry or amiss, be leaving the Pac-12 for the Big 12 beginning next academic year, 2024-25 want to talk essentially all about that for these first couple segments today. We'll look at the Big 12 side of it, the Pac-12 side of it, and then we'll get into a fun new home-and-home home matchup later on. Before I say any of that, a quick piece of good news from the James family. Going back to Wednesday, LeBron tweeted in response to Bronny's health scare earlier this week with his cardiac episode, quote, I want to thank the countless people sending my family love and prayers we feel you, and I'm so grateful. Everyone doing great. We have our family together, safe and healthy, and we feel your love. We'll have more to say when we're ready, but I wanted to tell you every to tell everyone how much your support has meant to all of us. Hashtag James Gang. End quote. So you know nothing groundbreaking other than to say it sounds like things are going well for Bronny. There, there's no specifics in there, and as as LeBron said. They'll, they'll have more to say when they're ready. Uh, the James clan has always done a good job of, of circling the wagons and keeping things tight. So uh, we'll hear something when we hear something. But it sounds like at least that the news is good. All right, let's get now into the Big 12 angle of adding in Colorado, not this season, but next season. Here's where things stand as of the time I'm recording this. As you all well know, when things like this are moving, the, the news can change very quickly. So um, by the time you're listening to this, whenever it is, things could be updated. But this is up to up to date as of um, sometime late Thursday afternoon. So um, Colorado, as you well know, has been in the Pac-12. You might not remember when it started, but they made the switch from the Big 12 to the Pac-12 back in 2011-12 for that academic year. But it turns out that this year is going to be their last one there. And then uh, we'll probably be moving over to, um, to the Big 12. The reason I say probably is that right now, as of the time we're talking about this, it's not all squared away. There's some more hurdles to jump, some more hoops to clear, whatever <laughs> phrase you want to use. But on Wednesday evening, the Big 12 presidents and chancellors voted unanimously to welcome back uh, Colorado. And that comes from sources across various media outlets. Too many for me to name and give them credit, but lots of them have said it. But again, there are still hurdles to cross. For example, Colorado will have to send a formal um, application for membership to the Big 12, which is expected to happen at some point. On Thursday, again, as I'm recording this, it hasn't happened yet, but uh, we it, we're told it's it's expected to on Thursday after a, a public meeting there at Colorado, um, and so that and apparently you know 
as things go with this, not apparently, um, thinking historically as things go with this, that part of it is more uh, formality than anything. It's really the the unanimous vote from the presidents and chancellors that helps clear that hurdle. So it seems like unless there's, you know, uh, a last minute something that goes wrong, this is where we're headed. So what does that mean in terms of number of teams for the Big 12? We're talking Big 12 angle of this right now. For this academic season, changes nothing for 2023-24. Remember, Houston, Cincinnati, BYU, and UCF just came in on July 1st at the beginning of the fiscal year, bringing the total to 14 teams, the 10 existing teams plus those four. Next year, the plan was supposed to be for 2024-25 for it to go back down to 12. What do you know? A conference called the Big 12 was going to have 12 teams in it because Texas and Oklahoma would be off to the SEC. But not so fast. Hold the phone. With adding Colorado, it would get that number up to 13. Now, this conference will not want to stay at 13. You don't want to have um, an, an odd number of teams. It's not what they're going to want to do. So the Big 12 will not be resting on their laurels. We'll talk more about that uh, as we go through this. But let's talk about reasons for this. To me, the most clear and obvious reason is the delay of the Pac-12 media rights deal. It's not been squared away. It's not been finished and finalized. And from reports I've read, ADs are still waiting on numbers and things like that. And so uh, the, this, this media rights deal not being done, I think, is the clear and main catalyst. But on the other side, by jumping ship and saying, well, let's go to Big 12, that seems like they got it figured out. Brett McMurphy reported that Colorado will receive a $31.6 million media share um, once the new deal kicks in in 2025, that, that new media rights deal that the Big 12 has. And that's not even counting other league revenue that they could get. And by the way, that's the same amount as the other Big 12 schools reports McMurtry. Um, and so McMurphy, excuse me, <laughs> on the football side, listen, for Colorado, they haven't been all that great. Since um, moving to the Pac-12, they haven't won a single bowl game, and they've had just two winning seasons. Not that the Big 12 is any easier in football. In fact, it might be harder. But um, I think in the coach prime era, things might change a little bit. That remains to be seen. But our side is the basketball side. That's what we're here to talk about. They spent 11 seasons in the Pac-12, Colorado did. They made the NCAA tournament five times in those 11 seasons, although, of course, one of them was the COVID year where there was no tournament. So the Buffs made exactly half of the NCAA tournaments of the seasons they were in the Pac-12. The, their seeds were five seed. That was the best they ever had. Two eights, a 10, and an 11. They only made it to the second weekend in one of those five years and lost in the Sweet 16 in that year. And that was the year they were an 11 seed. So it really hasn't been um, good for Colorado in the Pac-12. That's just where it is. But here's the kicker. You know, we, we look at, yeah, they made half of the tournaments, but four of those were in their first five years in the Pac-12. In the final six tournaments that they've spent in the Pac-12, they've made or six seasons, they've made the NCAA tournament just once in basketball. And so things have not been good lately, and they're gonna have to get that figured out at Colorado. So I don't know that a move to the Big 12 is gonna help from a competitive standpoint, but certainly from a financial standpoint, this is the move they've got to make geographically, super helpful for the conference's western expansion, right? With BYU joining, there's this big gap from Kansas to Utah with no Colorado in the middle. So getting Colorado back just helps make a little more sense of the geographic footprint for the conference, as well as picking up that uh, Denver media market back again is, is, I mean, it's not like top five in the country, but it is not a bad thing to have the Denver media market. So the next logical question again for me is this, who or what is next for this conference. Again, we're going to look at the Pac-12 side of that here in a second. But again, for me, I think that the Big 12 will not stand pat at 13. They're going to look to add at least number 14. There's obviously, because of Colorado leaving, there's a lot of scufflebutt. Is that the word? Is that what I'm looking for? Scuttlebutt. There you go. About one of the other Pac-12 schools maybe jumping, if not more. Um, the most noise I've heard is Arizona. So that could be one that the big 12 looks to add. Obviously we've heard a lot of news, uh, a lot of rumblings about the potential of UConn. Um, 
that talking about a geographical thing that makes sense and that one doesn't, but whatever makes sense in conference realignment geographically these days. So um, who even knows now, obviously there is much more to come on this, but this is where things stand right now. These are the things I'm looking at and thinking about with it coming up in the second, we're going to move to talking about the PAC 12 angle of this with locked on PAC 12 host, Spencer McLaughlin, who's going to help us figure out just how exactly to keep the conference of champions alive in this new era. But before we do that, I need to tell you that today's episode of Locked on College Basketball is brought to you by LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you got to check out LinkedIn Jobs, which helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. It's so easy to create a free job post, and then you just add the purple hashtag hiring frame to that profile to let everyone know and spread the word that you're hiring. Beyond that, you can use these simple tools that they have at LinkedIn, like screening questions, which make it easy to focus on the candidates with just the right skill set and experience so that you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and then ultimately hire. Let's be honest, the right team member can have a positive and measurable impact on your business. This is why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus the leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. So post your job for free right now at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Once again, that's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Well, we've just been looking at the Big 12 angle of Colorado coming back to the Big 12 conference what a kind of whirlwind it is. As we know, the Buffaloes have been in the Pac-12 since the 2011-12 academic year. And turns out, it looks like this is going to be their last one in the Pac-12. Now, uh, just to time mark this thing, because things are constantly moving of when we're having this conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, as we record this, not everything's been finalized yet. The Big 12 presidents and chancellors have unanimously voted to have Colorado back, but the big hurdle uh, that we're waiting on right now is still uh, Colorado to formally apply back to the Big 12. So we welcome in the host of Locked On Pac-12, Mr. Spencer McLaughlin at Smalls. What are the numbers? Underscore 55. I always got to remind myself. I know it's Smalls. Uh, and Spencer, here's the thing. First off, thank you for taking time out of what is a crazy uh, moment in your world when everyone's needing your voice in their ears. Uh, so I know you've been talking about this nonstop on your show and on other people's show. So here's my question. What does this move mean for the PAC 12 conference? Who's been working on trying to finalize a new media rights deal. I know it's like been your entire summer, probably uh, the, the on again, off again with San Diego state. It's like Ross and Rachel over there. And now <laughs> <laughs> now we have good. this we we learn that colorado is going to take this conference from 12 down to 11 schools spencer where are things at no actually they take it from 10 down to nine remember oh, usc and ucla that's are a gone. great point this is even... currently you yeah know, i i'm the host of locked on pac 12 which is presently a nine team conference great point starting in 2024 so the biggest question that everyone wants to know is can the pac 12 survive the answer is yes but there's an if, and there's a massive if, and there is no way to put a percentage or have an understanding of what the likelihood is with regards to what that if, or the, the likelihood that that if comes to pass or doesn't. The if is do other schools depart? There are rumors flying around about schools interested in the Big 12 and wanting to go over there, and y you can you know check out a variety of sources, some more reliable than others, that <laughs> have listed every school from Oregon to Oregon State to literally every school except Stanford and Cal calling and, and inquiring about the Big 12 and whether or not you know they would uh, they'd be welcome there. I don't have any reporting on on that end. I'm mostly not a reporter anyway, so that's not kind of my my mo, so to speak. But the question: Can the Pac-12 survive the loss of Colorado? The answer is yes, they can. If nobody else leaves. And if somebody else were to leave, say Arizona, for instance, then that might trigger a snowball effect. Oof. And you would be left with eight teams. And then you'd have to add four. And is that really enough? Like, I don't know. That that really, really calls it in, into question here. But Colorado 
Is it great for the Pac-12 to lose? Of course not. You know, Denver media market is, I think, top 20, top 25 in in the country. And of course, losing Los Angeles, the number two media market in the country, Pac-12 is already suffering in uh, in that part of it. I think that's a component of why they haven't been able to cobble together a television deal at this point in time. So do you want to lose them? No. But the, the momentum and the perception is far worse than the reality for the Pac, because if you're just talking athletically, right, people... I'm sure we'll jump to the conclusion. And it's natural to say, oh, they're losing another school. How could they possibly be a power conference? Colorado hasn't done diddly squat <laughs> athletically, aside from appear in one football conference championship game, have a winning season during COVID. Other than that, they've been a losing program every every single year. So the strength of the league from a football standpoint can't be questioned. Now, this is locked on college basketball. That's right. Colorado has been a staple of mediocrity. In the pack. <laughs> and every conference in America, if you said, hey, what if we took out the middle team? It's not, it's, not, it's not great, necessarily, but it's not materially impacting the strength or depth of the league in, in a sizable way. The question that Colorado brings up is, what is that going to trigger in terms of the next move? So the media rights angle now gets fascinating on the one hand, and pretty desperate, it seems, for the Pac-12 on the other. Because the reporting from people like Brett, Mc Brett McMurphy and others has indicated that the reason Colorado jumped, they did not want to jump. I've said that for a very long time, and I still believe that that is true. They did not want to jump. Because if they had wanted to jump to the Big 12, Isaac, they would have made this move in April. They would have made it in March. They would have made it in fit. The Big 12 has been courting them for months and months. And of course, it's finally worked out. But this is about the failure of the Pac-12 to get a media rights deal together and secure their future. And I think for Colorado, there is some logic here because you are trying to rebrand yourself athletically. You are mm -hmm. trying to rebrand your football program, which is your most important sports program. Again, I know this is a college basketball right. show. But, I but love it college is true. basketball. It's true. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Football is driving the bus here. They're worth about 85%. Football is worth about 85% of the valuation of a media rights contract. So if you're trying to usher in that new era, era with Deion Sanders, I understand that Colorado trying to rebrand themselves with a new coach, starting fresh, starting over, they want to have security. And the Pac-12 hasn't been able to offer them that at this point in time. And Isaac, in less than one month, we are going to have college football games being played. August 26th, there will be a Pac-12 team playing that's USC. So they got tired of waiting. They got tired of hearing from George Klyovkov that the media deal is almost done, that we're going to be there. They got tired of it. And I think that that, that that makes sense. Now, I thought that they would wait to see what the actual deal was, but it's just drawn on for so long. They got tired of waiting, and I get that. Now, the next move, the next domino that we're all kind of waiting to see is, well, who else will jump? And there has been an indication from Robert Robbins, the president of, uh, of the University of Arizona, and, and there have been some other quotes that I've seen as well from, from reporters to indicate that the rest of the Pac-12 are in people like Arizona who have, you know, had these kind of talks and made hints and dropped remarks, you know, about going to the Big 12 and such. They are going to still wait for the media deal. Colorado was not willing to be patient any yeah. longer, but everybody else is still in a, hey, let's see, let's see what we can get. But I don't think the Pac-12... You know, they, they have projected confidence. They have projected togetherness. They have projected assurance that stuff was going to get done, that they're going to make a deal happen, that everyone's going to stay together. And now that is not the case. So if the urgency hasn't ticked up for George Klyavkov, I don't exactly know what is going to cause that to happen. But now it gets more complicated, Isaac, because you've been having these media rights negotiations for months. And now with you Colorado have Colorado in the picture and with Colorado in the picture. Right. With the Denver media market in the picture. So what sort of value does that bring? Colorado was not a big TV viewership team for their entirety, for the entirety of their existence up until this season. They have never been a big television draw in the pack. They haven't done anything really worthy of note in the pack. So do they bring something to the table that is now lost and has to be renegotiated for the figures that the Pac-12 is going to be able to get? Or do they have to start close to you know, ground zero and go back to the beginning on the media rights front and basically try to structure a new looking deal. We don't know, but that has to happen. And then Isaac, you now have to expand. I was talking on my show leading up to, uh, you know, this news dropping yesterday 
that the likelihood of the league just staying at 10 teams, at least for a couple of years perhaps, was looking like it was growing as a possibility. You can't do that now. No, no. You can't, you can't not expand. There is no world in which I can see that the Pac-12 survives without expansion. You can't have nine teams, first of all. Odd, nobody's got odd numbers for a reason. It makes scheduling an <laughs> absolute nightmare, and someone yeah. is left without a travel partner, so someone would be unhappy. And you'd only have eight conference games to schedule for football, meaning you would then have to try and find other games, which are probably going to be buy games from FCS programs, and you have to do it on one year's notice. So I, I can't see that happening, the non-expansion that is. So I, I, I just am so curious to see what happens and also, you know, whether or not they, they st like they're still out there giving quotes to reporters about, uh, yeah, no, we're going to wait and see the deal. The deal's going to get done. Like no. they, they no. appear kind of unfazed yeah. by it at, at some level. And it's just like, yeah, I'm not, not buying that. <laughs> so, so Spencer, the, the next logical question for me then is where do you go? Do you go back to San Diego state? Did the Gonzaga talks pick back up, even though there's no football, like, how no, do you Gonzaga this, will not happen. How do you, so how do you fill this thing back out? Well, the San Diego State question becomes intriguing. And the name that is getting tossed around more than it was previously is Colorado State. Mm. You know, do you do you say, hey, we still want to be in the state of Colorado? I don't know. The the I don't know that that's a home run. Like I understand the logic of it, but I don't know that that's a home run move because Yes, Denver has some value, but how much are you going to carry that with Colorado State? Right. The, how far is Fort Collins from Denver? Do you know? I think it's I within. I think it's within a couple hours. Okay. Um. The, the, but but I don't know. I'm not super familiar with the geography of uh, of the state <laughs> of, of the Colorado. Square. But that so when you, when you're thinking about the presence you want to have as a conference, where you want to be, what states do you want to be in? San Diego State has always been the top option because it's Southern California. You got to be in Southern California. Is anyone sitting in there saying you have to be in Colorado? No. Is it a recruiting hotbed? No. Is it, you know, a massive media market? It's a solid one for sure. But is it, you know, is it so coveted that they'd say, oh my gosh, we lost Colorado. We have to go with Colorado State. I don't believe so. Hmm. So I would, and, and, and look, Colorado State would face the same hurdle that San Diego State would face, which is, hey, the Mountain West, the deadlines for everything that we talked about a month ago, that's all come and gone. So leaving to join the league by 2024, that's going to cost you $34 million, Ooh. not 17. And that is a pretty, pretty penny. So I don't know that Colorado State is as feasible as they might seem on the outset of things. Yeah. But here's here's a thought for you, Isaac. One, one idea that I have long suggested is the Pac-12 – add San Diego State, but wait until 2025 to add them because then the exit fee is only $17 million, which is what they were wanting to do. Pac-12 couldn't get the media deal done in time, so then San Diego State got screwed. They actually got an extension de facto from the Mountain West in a brilliant game of, uh, of verbal and public jargon, essentially, but then that didn't come to fruition because the Mountain West yeah. said, okay, we've given you the time. And San Diego State said, okay, we're, we're, we're staying here. And that's, and that's all, that's all good and fine. But so in that, in that scenario, just survive as a nine team conference for the 24, 25 season. No, you need to survive as a 10 team conference. You cannot operate with nine teams. You okay. can't only have eight conference games. You cannot only have uh, you can't have an odd number of teams. I, I cannot see them doing that, but here's what they could do. Now they could have 10 teams, in 2024 and 2025, and then 12 by the following season. The 10th team could be SMU because mm -hmm. SMU is not bound to the same set of rules that San Diego State is. So San Diego State leaving the Mountain West is more expensive than SMU leaving the American. Gotcha. And San Diego State, I've talked about them more on my show over the, over the summer, frankly, because their timeline was pretty set and clear. Right. But SMU's timeline and the exit fee that they will be charged if they end up leaving them the American and joining the pack, ha it doesn't change. If they had announced expansion two months ago, if they announce expansion in one month, it doesn't change because the American Conference bylaws stipulate that you have to provide 27 months notice of when you are leaving the conference. You know, like you're going to leave by this date. If you are outside of that 27 month window, then it's a $10 million base exit fee. But if you say to the conference, we are leaving the American, 
you owe them more than 10 million if you're within a 27 months window. So when you consider that the athletic season starts July 1st, 2024, that 27 month window was never going to be attained by by SMU. So that's why adding them in January versus adding them in August did not matter and does not matter, frankly. So they could be, and by the way, the three teams that just joined the Big 12, Cincinnati, Houston, and UCF, they were not joining uh, outside of the 27-month window. They all owe the American Conference, I believe it's $17 million, $18 million or so, paid out over the next 11 years. So they're going to pay the conference a little more than a million dollars, uh, between one and two million dollars a year for 11 years, and that's their exit. So SMU, in theory, could get the same exit and if they were to be the 10th team, you could be at 10 teams for a year. And then you could move on with San Diego State and, and somebody and, and somebody else and then get them by 2025. Yeah. And BYU coming to the Big 12 as well. Let's remember the Cougs oh, yeah. uh, in, in that calculus. Man, Can't forget great. Mark Pope squad. Can I? No, no. Mark Pope bringing it. Uh, that crazy wildcat from Big Blue Nation. Spencer McLaughlin, thank you so much for getting us caught up to date on all this. Uh, man, I hadn't even, with all this whirlwind, I had legitimately not even processed the UCLA, USC, and Colorado and all of that, man. <laughs> yeah. So it's just blowing yeah. my mind even more now as we sit and process all of this. Really appreciate it. Hope your voice holds up today. Keep on trucking. Going to drink a lot of water today, my friend. Thank you. San Diego State might not be joining the Pac-12 right now anyway, <laughs> but we did get news earlier this week of a home and home scheduled with North Carolina and Kansas. Big news. And now we get a West Coast home and home that is making me salivate. Those very San Diego State Aztecs and the Gonzaga Bulldogs, two of the best teams on the West Coast. Another great move in the college basketball world. We'll talk about that in just a second. But first, this episode of Locked on College Basketball is brought to you by eBay Motors. For a championship game, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure that every part you need fits just right the first time around. All you got to do is add your vehicle to my garage and then you look for the green check to know that the part will fit or you get your money back. Because just like sports, confidence is the name of the game when it comes to shopping on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you're going to be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a victory when the right parts are guaranteed. So get the right parts with the right fit and at the right price on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Okay, so let's talk about this awesome home and home that San Diego State and Gonzaga have just scheduled. It's been a week of exciting home and home announcements. There have been several, but the these are the two that stand out to me. First, earlier this week, North Carolina and Kansas scheduling true home and homes like in Fog Allen Fieldhouse and in the Dean Smith Center. That will be not this year, but 2024-25 and 2025-26. Yeah, it's so weird to think about all those numbers. And now we get Gonzaga and San Diego State scheduling two more true on-campus home-and-home games. This is phenomenal for college basketball. Andy, uh, my co-host, talked about the Carolina-Kansas one earlier in the week, and now we're going to talk about this one. Before we get into the specifics of the series, here's what's so cool about teams like this, these four teams we've been talking about doing this. Again, Kansas, North Carolina, San Diego State, and Gonzaga. When you think about those four teams, what do they have in common? I'll give you a second to think on it. Think national championship games recently. There it is. These four teams have all been in the national championship in the last three years. So that means four of the last six national championships this week have scheduled big time, prime time, home and home, true home and home series with another high level team or program around the country. This is what we need more of in college basketball. And man, I just got to say 
Thank you to all of these coaches for what they're doing and keep it up. So San Diego State, obviously last year, Kansas and Carolina in 2022, and Gonzaga was in the championship in 2021. So this is awesome. Love that. Let's look at the details of the series. All due respect to the Pac-12, and you know, as we just talked about, it might be crumbling around us, but we'll have to keep our eyes on it. Gonzaga and San Diego State are two of the best programs on the West Coast right now, have been operating at such for the last couple of years. Need proof? You, you know, I, I'm sure there's naysayers out there that's like, Isaac, what are you talking about? At the D1 level, so all 360 plus teams that we have now, per in San Diego State's release about this series, since the start of the 1920, the 2019-2020 season, Gonzaga has the best winning percentage in the nation. And San Diego, State has, San Diego State has the third best winning percentage in the nation. So yeah, I'm coming at you with numbers that say these are two of the best teams, not only on the West Coast, like I said, but nationally. And I know part of that is the conferences they play in, whatever. It still takes a ton. Like you have to be a really, really good basketball team with a really, really good coach to win at that level. I don't care where you're at or who you're playing. Now, here's what's interesting and different about this series than the Kansas and North Carolina one is that this one starts this year. So San Diego state is headed North first to Gonzaga to play on December 29th of this year, right before new year's. That'll be on a Friday, interestingly enough. And again, it's actually at the McCarthy athletic center, or as we better know, I'll say it together. There you go. I hear you out there saying it. Uh, there you go. And then next season, we'll have Gonzaga traveling to San Diego State at some point in the 24-25 season. So we get the kennel this year. And then next year, they will be at the Viejas Arena. And this is so good. Again, we don't have that date. I'm sure we'll find it out at some point. All time, these two teams, this will be their fifth meeting, the one that happens this year. And it's dead even. They've both won two games so far, both of these programs. San Diego State, though, won the last game 72-70 to against 12th-ranked Gonzaga back in December of 2017. And so, man, just expect another high-level game from two high-level teams. And so this is awesome. And again, I just want to go back and say a couple things about why I, I love what they're doing here. Number one, these true road games are so good for the entity that is college basketball, both the in-person and the TV versions, like a, a game at the kennel or a game at Viejas Arena is just going to be better than a more sterile environment wherever it is, or even a massive um, football stadium, like where we play the final four. It just isn't the same as all being together on campus in that space. And then the TV version looks better too, because it's, it's, in specifically planned to host that type of event. And so it's really, really good to do, to be able to do this. And, and remember last season, Kentucky and Gonzaga scheduled like a six game, six year series home and home. But last year, Kentucky went up and played the Zags in Spokane arena. Remember that whole kerfuffle with kerfuffle, not kerfuffle. There's no first L kerfuffle between like, but this year Gonzaga is actually going to play in rep arena. And I, I think the very last game in the series, Kentucky actually is going to play at the kennel. So that's good. But at, like, I, I just love it when there's no like hemming and hawing. Let's just go make this happen on campus. Love it. Thank you to these coaches again. I also love it being on a Friday night. And I know that's an, an unsexy TV viewing window um, just because people are out doing stuff and that's where shows go to die. But it is an untapped sports window that if you make it appointment viewing with great matchups like this, I think you could get a little corner of some market on a Friday. And it, at this point in the year when that's going to be um, bowl games going on, those will be taking place probably on Saturday, the next day, the 30th. And so lo love it. Own that Friday night is great. And then as we get closer to these act this actual game, we'll obviously talk more in depth about it, but it should be electric. San Diego State is obviously returning a good number of their players from their national runner-up team. Gonzaga has to replace quite a bit, but had a lot waiting in the wings and has brought in several players that I'm interested in seeing how they do from the transfer portal. So going to be an electric. And it's not just these two coaches, and it's not just Hubert Davis and Bill Self either. Like Scott Drew at Baylor is known to be a guy that will go play anybody anywhere. 
Tom Izzo, Michigan State, notoriously. I guess that's got a negative connotation when you say notoriously. Or maybe that's infamously. Words and I are having issues with each other today. Anyway, notably, how about that? Tom Izzo schedules hard uh, non-conference slate. Heck, even John Shire at Duke scheduled a home and home with Arizona that starts this year. Um, that is a true departure from the way Coach K did his non-conference where Duke never left Cameron for a true road game, I guess I should say, unless they were forced to in the ACC Big Ten Challenge. So this is great. So good for college basketball. More please coaches and programs always, always, always. Friends, that's it for this week of Locked On College Basketball and obviously this episode too. Really appreciate you joining us. You everydayers, always glad to have you back even here in late July. Going to be, man, I mean, it's almost August and then it's just a few short football will fly by and then we're going to be getting some basketball. I can't wait. You can follow the show on Twitter at Locked On CBB. You can follow me at Isaac Shade. Don't forget to go give Spencer a follow as well at Smalls underscore 55. Please make sure to subscribe to the show on audio and video format. Smash the like button if you're watching so we know you're here. We'd love to hear your comments on all of this conference realignment and these home and home matchups. As always, apologies to the lawyer family. Go Wildcats, and until Monday when Andy and I are back with you, peace.